Hello and welcome to Dove Biology Apes Lessons to Go. In this video we'll be exploring conservation biology and an introduction to sustaining biodiversity. Conservation biology is a multidisciplinary science that uses the best science to take action and preserve a species. It's based on Aldo Leopold's ethical principle that he wrote about in his text, The Sand County Almanac. His ethical principle states that something is right when it tends to maintain the Earth's life support system, and this is certainly true of conservation biology and sustaining wild species. In 1900, there were 315,000 wild orangutans. Now there is only 20,000 in the wild, and they're disappearing at a rate of about 2,000 per year due to illegal smuggling and the clearing of their forest habitat in Indonesia and Malaysia to make way for oil palm plantations. Why should we conserve a species like the orangutan? There are two reasons why conservation should be at the forefront of our minds, and that is an organism's instrumental value and its intrinsic value. An organism's instrumental value can be broken up into two parts, its use value and its non-use value. An organism's use value is the usefulness that an organism has in terms of its economic and ecological services that it performs. Its non-use value are its existence, aesthetic, and bequest values. An existent value is just the joy that a person gets from knowing that an organism exists in the wild. Its aesthetic value is the value of an organism for the joy that we get as we observe that organism in the wild. And its bequest value is the joy that we have knowing that it will be present for future generations. The intrinsic value of an organism just its inherent right to exist. Now, unfortunately, some animals have become prematurely extinct as a result of human activities, like the passenger pigeon or the dusky seaside sparrow. Species can go extinct in a number of different ways. They can become locally extinct, which means that it's no longer found in an area that it once inhabited, but it's still found elsewhere in the world. It can become ecologically extinct, um, and this occurs when there's so few members of a species that are left that they can no longer play its ecological role. And then finally, organisms can become globally or biologically extinct, which means that it's no longer found on the Earth. Biologists can classify species that are on their way to extinction as being either endangered or threatened. Endangered species are those which have so few individual survivors that it could soon become extinct. Whereas threatened species are still abundant in its natural range, but it's likely to become endangered in the near future. Some species have characteristics which make them vulnerable to ecological and biological extinction. For example, they may have a very slow reproductive rate and maybe be classified as a K-selected species like a blue whale or a giant panda. As a result of such a, a low reproductive rate, they'll have a really hard time recovering from a great loss. Some organisms have a very specialized niche, like the blue whale or the Everglades kite. When that habitat gets destroyed, that niche is no longer available for them to fill, and so therefore they would go extinct. Maybe they have a very narrow distribution, or they're already rare in the environment, like a island species, for example. When that habitat gets destroyed, or when organisms uh, from those environments get harvested, there's so few that they will be unable to recover. Some uh, organisms feed at high trophic levels, like uh, our tertiary consumers, like tigers and grizzly bears. When their habitat is devastated and their prey species are eliminated, then they're going to be at greater risk for extinction. And then finally, there are some organisms that are commercially valuable as a result of their meat, their fur, or the presence of tusks or horns, like snow leopards or rhinoceros. And when they're over-harvested, they're going to be at a greater risk for extinction. So how would a biologist estimate an extinction risk? Well, scientists will do a risk assessment called a population viability analysis.
which uses mathematical and statistical methods to predict the number of generations that a population will persist, persist based upon its current population size and habitat conditions. This often includes doing a minimum viable population assessment in which we determine the smallest number of individuals um, which will sustain a population in a given region, as well as the minimum dynamic area analysis, where we f figure out what's the smallest suitable habitat that can sustain a particular population. Scientists use these measurements and models to estimate extinction rates. The International Union for the Conservation of Nature and Natural Resources, the IUCN, publishes an annual red list listing the world's threatened species. In 2004, the list contained 15,589 individuals. The 2007 update contained 16,306. And most recently, the 2013 update contains 20,930 species at risk for extinction. As you can see, with each consecutive update, the number of species at risks are increasing. Now, certain species types are at greater risk uh, for extinction than others. There are over 34% of the world's fish species, 51% of our freshwater species, that are at uh, risk for premature extinction. 25% of all mammals, 20% of reptiles, 14% of plants, and 12% of birds are threatened with premature extinction from human activities. Conservation biologists can summarize the most important causes of premature extinction as HIPCO. It used to just be HIPPO, but we've added an additional C to include climate change. H will stand for habitat destruction, degradation, and fragmentation. I stands for invasive species. P for population growth. P for pollution. And then our O for over harvest. So scientists believe that the greatest threat to a species is the loss, degradation, and fragmentation of where it lives. Now certain types of species are particularly vulnerable to local and regional extinction because of habitat fragmentation. They would include species that are rare, species that need to roam unhindered over large areas, and species that have a low reproductive capacity. Here we can examine uh, four major species, the Indian tiger, the black rhino, the African elephant, and the Asian or Indian elephant, um, and compare their range um, from many years ago to today and see that as a result of human activity and hunting, we have greatly reduced the range of these organisms. After habitat loss and degradation, the biggest cause of premature extinction is the deliberate or accidental introduction of a harmful species into an ecosystem, like the uh, Argentinian ant. Most species introductions are beneficial to us, although they often displace native species. We depend heavily on introduced species for ecosystem services, food, shelter, medicine, and aesthetic enjoyment. Introduced corn, wheat, rice, and other food crops provide more than 98% of the United States food supply. Similarly, non-native tree species are grown in 85% of the world's tree plantations. The problem is, is that many of the introduced species have no natural predators, competitors, parasites, or pathogens to control their numbers. Such non-native species can wipe out populations of native ones. Human population growth and excessive and wasteful consumption of resources have greatly expanded the human ecological footprint, which has eliminated vast areas of wildlife habitat. Acting together, these factors have caused premature extinction of many species. Pollution also threatens some species with extinction has been shown by the unintended effects of certain pesticides. Each year, pesticides kill about one-fifth of the U.S. honeybee colonies. They kill 67 million birds, 6 to 14 million fish, and threaten one-fifth of the U.S. endangered and threatened species. During the 1950s and 1960s, populations of fish-eating birds such as ospreys, brown pelicans, and bald eagles plummeted. 
A chemical derived from pesticide DDT when biologically magnified in food webs made the bird's eggshells so fragile they could not reproduce successfully. Also hard hit were such predatory birds as the prairie falcon, sparrowhawk, and peregrine falcon, which helped to control rabbits, ground squirrels, and other crop eaters. Since the U.S. ban on DDT in 1972, most of these species have made a comeback. A 2004 study by Conservation International predicted that climate change caused mostly by global warming could drive more than one quarter of the land, animals, and plants to extinction by the end of this century. The world's 20,000 to 25,000 polar bears are at great risk. Evidence shows that the Arctic warming is twice as fast as the rest of the world and that the average annual area of floating summer sea ice in the Arctic is declining and breaking up earlier each year. This means that polar bears have less time to feed and to store fat they need in order to survive their summer and fall months of fasting. Polar bears are strong swimmers, but ice shrinkage has forced them to swim longer distances to find enough food and to spend more time during the winter hunting on land where prey is nearly impossible to find. Several studies link global warming and diminished sea ice to polar bears drowning or starving while in search of prey. Some protected species are killed for their valuable parts or sold live to collectors. Legal and illegal trade in wildlife species used as pets or for decorative purposes threaten some species with extinction. Bushmeat hunting has caused the local extinction of many animals in West Africa. The hunting for bushmeat can actually spread diseases such as HIV and the Ebola virus. International treaties have helped reduce the international trade of endangered and threatened species, but enforcement is very difficult. One of the most powerful international treaties is the 1975 Convention on the International Trade of Endangered Species, abbreviated CITES. Roughly 5,000 species of animals and 28,000 species of plants are protected by CITES against overexploitation through international trade. They are listed in the three sites appendices according to how threatened they are by international trade. One of the world's most far-reaching and controversial environmental laws is the 1973 U.S. Endangered Species Act. The Endangered Species Act forbids federal agencies, besides the Defense Department, to carry out or fund projects that would jeopardize an endangered species. The Endangered Species Act makes it illegal for Americans to engage in commerce associated with hunt, kill, or collect endangered or threatened species. Unfortunately, because of the scarcity of inspectors, probably no more than one-tenth of the illegal wildlife trade in the U.S. is discovered. CITES and the Endangered Species Act are the major laws governing wildlife, but there are many state and federal laws. For example, the Lacey Act bans interstate trade in wildlife, and the Migratory Bird Act protects migratory birds and waterfowl. We are degrading and destroying biodiversity in many parts of the world, and these threats are increasing. Species are becoming extinct 100 to 1,000 times faster than they were before modern humans arrived on the Earth. And by the end of this century, extinction rates expected to be 10,000 times the background rate. We should prevent the premature extinction of wild species because of the economic and ecological services they provide and because they have a right to exist regardless of their usefulness to us. The greatest threats to any species are loss or degradation of its habitat, harmful invasive species, human population growth, pollution, climate change, and overexploitation. We can use existing environmental laws and treaties and work to enact new laws designed to prevent premature species extinction and protect overall biodiversity.